In Britain, the Vulcan Motor Company was proud to film the way their workers assembled cars, slowly and carefully by hand. Craftsmen worked in their own way, at their own pace. The whole process took several weeks from start to finish. These handmade cars were so expensive that a wide gulf separated those who built them from those who bought them. But the days when cars were just luxuries for the rich were drawing to a close. In 1908, one man's vision would change manufacturing and create a new market. Henry Ford set out to make the simplest car ever. A car for rural America. A 20th century equivalent of the horse and buggy. To produce the Model T cheaply, Ford knew he had to change the way cars were built. That meant changing the way his workers worked. As he reorganized his factory to turn out Model T's, he was influenced by the efficiency expert, Frederick Taylor. Taylor complained that hardly a workman can be found who doesn't devote his time to studying just how slowly he can work. And then he devoted his life to speeding them up. When Taylor was brought in, he first timed the workers with stopwatches and noted their every movement. In a famous experiment at an ironworks, he reorganized a worker named Schmidt. Previously, Schmidt had hand carried 12 tons of pig iron a day up from a wagon. After Taylor rearranged things, the tolerant Mr. Schmidt found himself carrying 47 tons and production had been raised 300 percent. Called into an office, Taylor helped the world's fastest typist type even faster. The new world record of 150 words a minute was achieved by Margaret Owen, and Taylor claimed much of the credit. At Ford's factory, Taylorism meant dividing automobile production into simple repetitive steps. There would be no need for skilled craftsmen with years of apprenticeship. Men could learn to do any job quickly. A trained wheelwright no longer made each wheel in its entirety. Wheel making was broken down into almost a hundred steps, done by different men at different machines. It was much faster, but workers could still complete only 200 cars a day. So in 1913, Ford introduced his most revolutionary change yet. In those days, each car was built from the frame up on stationary wooden horses. The Ford Motor Company filmed a reenactment of how Henry Ford first tried out his new idea. Henry Ford watched it for a while, then he had an inspiration. Instead of moving the men past the cars, why not move the cars past the men? So on one hot August morning, they tried it that way. A husky young fellow put a rope over his shoulder, and Henry Ford called, let's go. And at that very moment, as the workmen began to fasten the parts onto the slowly moving car, the assembly line was born. Soon assembly lines were up and running in Ford's factory. The lines became the key to mass production, a system that would remain virtually unchanged for most of the century. A network of clanging conveyors was used to deliver parts to an exact point on the line. The workers became an integral part of the great machine and management set the pace without discussion or negotiation for unions were forbidden 
The men faced new pressure as the final assembly line beat out the rhythm for the whole factory. There was no way they could stop or slow it down. Few stood the pace and din for long. Men tried it for a few weeks, then quit. But Ford had an answer. The company was making record profits. The time taken to build each car had dropped to one and a half hours, so he could afford to raise pay. When he announced he was doubling wages to the unheard of level of five dollars a day, the factory was besieged with applicants. By 1920, Detroit was a boom town. Its population had quadrupled since 1900. Other car makers adopted the Ford method. Ford's recipe, mass production, low costs, high wages, was creating not only cheap cars, but well-paid workers. By the mid-1920s, Ford had built the largest factory in the world. At the River Rouge plant, coal, iron, sand, and rubber were delivered at one end, and 2,500 Model Ts a day streamed out the other. Up to 80,000 men worked there. Above all, it was the constant supply of new men arriving in Detroit that made it possible. The company set the terms. If they worked fast and obeyed orders, they got the wages. Over 70% were recent immigrants, so the company had its own language schools. I fill the kettle with water. It was a game for which Ford made the rules simple but strict. High pay for hard work. Ford's private security force, the Plant Protection Service, kept discipline. Anyone who recruited for the unions was fired. Company spies kept a lookout for those considered to be troublemakers. Ford stressed all the material benefits high pay could bring. Workers were encouraged to put part of their wages aside each week to save for their own car through a company-run plan. In 